Welcome to Erdic Live. I'm your host, Shelly Tingle with the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. And today is season three of Erdic Live, season three, episode one. And right now, today, we also want to give a shout out to the ITL crew for designing a fabulous new studio home for Erdic Live. So thank you so much to our ITL friends who do such a great job of sh helping us share the Erdic story. As our first guest of season three, I want to welcome Dr. Kate Brody, research oceanographer with the Coastal Hydraulics, Coastal and Hydraulics Laboratories Field Research Facility, or FRF. Since it was founded in 1977, the FRF has monitored the coastal ocean, including waves, tides, currents, weather, and associated beach response. The observatory located in Duck, North Carolina, is a premier location for complex nearshore research and engineering studies. Featuring a 1,840-foot pier, amphibious vehicles, and high-tech sensors and programs, the portion of the Atlantic coastline the FRF looks over is arguably the best studied beach and surf zone in the world. The FRF's long-term measurements have informed countless discoveries, journal papers, reports, and more, making it a vital component of Erdic's innovative research environment. Welcome, Dr. Brody. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about the history of the field research facility and how it has grown since 1977. Sure. So the, the FRF has a really rich history. Um, so it was originally proposed in 1963. Um, and at the time, really the field of coastal science and engineering was really in its infancy. So there was really just not a lot known about coastal processes driving change along our coastlines. And in particular, um, how the coastline responds to storms and the damage that storms create were really a lot of the unknown questions. Um, so right around the time of creation, there were a series of large storms that moved up the U.S. East Coast and really devastated a lot of the major cities like Hurricane Sandy. And so that was sort of where the, the federal government recognized that, that, hey, we need to come together and we need to study these processes more. Um, and so there were four main goals associated with the creation of the FRF. Um, the first was to figure out how to collect data during storms and to collect collect as much data during storms as possible so we could start to understand those risks a little bit better. Um, the second was to really create a field base, not only for the Army Corps of Engineers, but also for our partners at other federal agencies, private industry, and academia to use to come together to study these processes. Um, in addition, uh, we really needed to develop the capabilities to make field measurements. At the time, most coastal engineering was being done in labs or some really rudimentary numerical models, um, and we really didn't have the methodology to be able to collect these measurements in the surf zone, which is a super challenging place to work. And then the, the fourth goal was to provide a place for continued innovation and testing of new instrumentation and to provide great background data sets to continue to develop these new techniques. Um, and so I think what's really cool is that if you look back on those four initial goals of the facility, they still really permeate the ethos of the FRF here today um, and that strong emphasis on collaboration. There were a series of collabor large collaborative experiments throughout the 80s and 90s that really formed the core data sets of the fields of coastal science and engineering. And I can say, like, as a researcher working here today, you feel the responsibility of continuing to collect those data sets for the entire global research community in the fields of coastal science and engineering. And, and also that commitment to helping others collect their own data in the surf zone. We have a lot of external folks who come to the FRF to do experiments, and we always want to help them um, be able to conduct their experiments successfully. Um, and so I think sort of those original four goals still really permeate what the facility is about today. And then thinking about how it's grown, I think we've grown a lot. I actually just got to go through our whole historical archives as I was putting together a, a presentation for ICCE and you know saw the original photos of the original staff. I think it was about 10 people. There were only two scientists, the rest was support staff. And today when I look around, we have about 30 
uh, staff working here at the facility. We have 16 engineers and scientists um, and the rest are support staff, so about split 50-50. Um, and I think one of the cool things about our engineering and scientist staff today is that's actually split 50-50 men and women, which I think is, is something I've been really passionate about growing and developing. And so it's really cool to see that here. Um, so our staff has increased. I think um, our staff's goals have also shifted. You know, originally the staff here was really put here to support others conducting research experimentation in the surf zone. Um, and today there's a lot more emphasis on the staff and the and the researchers here conducting their own research projects uh, to support the Army Corps needs for both civil and military operations, as well as on transitioning a lot of the techniques that we've learned here into more operational use. Um, and then I would say like the biggest change is probably the sheer quantity of data we collect. You know, when the FRF first started, we were really learning how to do this. They were thrilled if they got one measurement during a storm and they maybe got one cross shore profile transect measured before and after. And now you know, we probably should calculate the statistic on how much data we collect on an hourly basis. We haven't done that, um, you know, but we've really expanded from just a few simple wave observations and a few survey lines to being able to measure continuously wave transformation across the continental shelf from the shelf break to the shoreline. Um, we conduct monthly surveys which span the length of the property a kilometer along the beach. Um, and now with remote sensing technologies, we're really making hourly observations of a lot of these coastal processes. Um, so we can actually, in some places on our property, measure how the beach is responding in response to every wave that hits our shoreline. So I think the sheer quantity of data and the, you know, what we're able to collect has really changed over the course of evolution of the FRF. And I think these this ability to make these observations are really changing sort of our perception of just how dynamic the beach and surf zone are. So it's a, it's a really cool time, I think, to be working in the fields of coastal science and engineering because our capabilities have developed so much. And so the FRF serves as, as you just mentioned, a natural lab or test bed for field instrumentation and numerical models. You have sensors that continuously monitor the coastal conditions, as you said, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Can you tell us about the capabilities and skill sets required for such data collection, especially in these rough surf zones? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think um, that's something the staff here really pride themselves on being able to do successfully. So, you know, we've really learned how to work in the surf zone, what types of unique vessels we need, things like uh, larks, which is an amphibious uh, boat, kind of like the duck boats or duck tours you might go on in in, in cities around the country. Um, and, and then we have this giant amphibious crawling tripod called the crab or coastal research amphibious buggy. So they really had to come up with unique waves to be able to safely go into the surf and deploy instrumentation and then to be able to go get that instrumentation back. And I think our operations team here at the F FRF, what they do, they do probably better than really anyone else in the world. They have, you know, 40 years now of experience of figuring out how to put instrumentation in the surf, so much so that we can usually guarantee to folks that we're going to get it back, um, which is, you know, sort of mind boggling when you're deploying instrumentation in the surf, you know, to know that you're going to get that back. That's that's such a unique thing that I think um, the FRF brings to the table. And when people come here to to do experiments, they really um, they look for that expertise. Um, and I would say it's it's really also a team effort. One of the cool things about being a researcher here is you can have this cool idea of how you want to take an instrument that's probably designed to do something else entirely and the manufacturer will tell you oh don't put it there don't don't put it under a breaking wave don't leave it up in the hurricane and but that's exactly the processes we want to study and so being able to take that idea over to the operations team and be like hey how do we do this? What do we need to do to make this safe and make it possible? It's really fun. You get to work back and forth with them and, and figure out how to put really expensive equipment out during hurricanes, make sure that it collects the data during the hurricane and that you get it back. Um, and then I think 
as a researcher in terms of the skills that you need to be successful with working with these data and, and asking these questions, I mean, modern coastal science and engineering really does ask a lot of our researchers because not only do you have to be like an expert in the field of your study, so be that coastal engineering, oceanography, geology, physics, but you probably have to know something about the instrumentation you're using. So be a little bit of an expert in like optics or acoustics or geomatics to use some of these new remote sensing technologies. Then you get all this data back and it's super noisy data because we're putting it out in the harshest conditions where it's the toughest to make the measurements. So you have to be really good at signal processing, be able to work with a lot of big data. And, you know, in this day and age, you're probably going to need to know something about machine learning or other big data algorithms or even computer vision algorithms. So it, it does ask a lot of our researchers to be able to do this successfully. So a lot of skill sets are required to do this type of research, that's for sure. So I want to remind the audience that whether you're on YouTube or LinkedIn, that you are part of the conversation and we are going to be taking your questions and asking them to Dr. Kate Brody um, as soon as we're done in just a few minutes. So get your questions up and ready. So. Dr. Brody, how have the data sets that you were just talking about, all this large data and models developed at FRF, supported military operations? Sure. Um, so, you know, one of the cool things about working here and working for the Army Corps of Engineers is that the research we do supports both both our civil works needs here at home, um, but also the warfighter and, and the Army's needs. And so typically when we think about how does research conducted at the FRF help um, the warfighter, we're thinking about any littoral operation. And, and littoral is just a fancy word for coastal. Um, so any type of operation that goes from the land to the sea or from the sea to the land. And when the military is executing those types of op operations, one of the biggest hazards comes from the natural environment hazards because they have to get through this really dynamic surf zone. And one of the hard parts of that is you can't make a map six months ahead of time and know what the surf zone is going to look like and what the conditions are going to be. And so you need to be able to really accurately on the fly update your information on what the water depths look like close to shore, what is the wave and current uh, conditions those days, what are the breaking waves going to be, which way is the current moving. And so it's this really dynamic environment. And right now, you know, our, our warfighter has to do all that interpretation in their head while they're driving these crazy vessels, you know, hopefully not getting shot at, but there's always that aspect you have to consider. And, and so what we really want to do is try to take a lot of that guesswork and a lot of the hazards of the natural environment out of it for the warfighter. Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, you know, experienced watermen can walk up to a beach, look out at the waves and, and read the water. A surfer knows exactly where to paddle out, where's the easiest place, or, you know, a, a sailing captain knows how to figure out where the currents are, are moving and everything just by looking at the water because they have tons of experience. And so, you know, what we try to do here is sort of digitize that process, I guess, um, and figure out how to use different sensors to be able to uh, quantify the natural environment in as close to near real time as possible, be that from cameras or LIDARs on board the vessels, or maybe from overhead satellites or, or other assets that might be in the area to really paint them a picture of, you know, what is the environment that they're going to be going through and, and how will that impact the operation. And then a lot of the models that are being used today by the by truly the joint forces were all developed off of data sets that were collected here at the FRF. So it's, it's you know, it's a small community. Um, our capabilities are, are really built off of these found foundational data sets that have been developed here at the FRF. And so it's really cool to see sort of how far reaching um, some of these data sets have gotten and some of the numerical modeling techniques, how they're being employed and used. That it's absolutely fascinating how all this technology is being used for these no-go, go situations um, that our military faces. And so um, through, how have you leveraged all this knowledge that you've gained through coastal military operations to solve challenging civil works projects? 
Yeah, that's it. That's a great question. And and like I said, that's one of the things I love about working at Urtic is we can take some of this basic physics knowledge on coastal processes and then apply it to a lot of different problem sets. And so I would say probably in, in recent years, uh, some of the military funding has helped drive a lot of our innovation in new sensing techniques and particularly with remote sensing, which has been one of my uh, areas of focus in my research. Um, and so you know, on the military side, we've looked to remote sensing because we want to be able to gather this environment data remotely so we don't have to send somebody in to know the bottom position or, or the surf zone conditions. Um, and so the innovation to answer that question on the military side means that we've developed a lot more automated remote observation techniques, which can be miniaturized. Um, and we can now use those to improve continuous monitoring of our coast here at home. Um, um, and, you know, our districts have, have really been at a disadvantage, I think, in the past over not having a lot of data with which to make coastal engineering and management decisions because collecting data in the surf zone when you have to send someone into the surf zone is super costly. Um, and so if we can collect some of those same data from these remote observation points, we can do that a lot more cheaply, we can do that over larger areas, and we can do it continuously, which means we can get a much better understanding of the natural processes actually acting on that stretch of coast. So for example, we can now, we can take a camera and we can place it on a hotel roof and that can provide hourly observations of the shoreline position in, in all conditions. And then we can use those observations to tell us whether our beach nourishment designs are working as we expect, or whether we need to sort of rethink things and employ adaptive management techniques. Um, We've also miniaturized some technology to, to place it on, on UAVs or drones um, that allows our districts to measure topography and, and bathymetry just from just or water depths just from imagery. Um, and and that's that allows them to go out and collect those data at much higher temporal resolution. So instead of getting maybe one survey of a site per year, they could go out and now do a quarterly survey or something like that, or get a survey right before the storm season so we can really better quantify the impact of our storms to the beaches. And, you know, I think we're on this cool cutting edge where we're also now looking to satellites to think about uh, what type of data we can extract out of this to be able to do it at national scales in an automated fashion, which I think really changes uh, the landscape of coastal engineering data because we can now say what is the now state of our coasts at national scales and what does that now mean for our flooding risks, our emergency management decisions, um, and we can ask those questions with up-to-date data in the face of approaching storms. Um, so I think it's a really fun time to be a coastal scientist and engineer because we're not going to be making our coastal management and engineering decisions from a data-starved place. We're going to be making them from a much more data-informed place moving forward. And that also allows you to have a lot of confidence in your data, having so much of it and know that you have good fidelity to, to make these decisions. So I want to remind our audience once again that um, we're going, I'm going to be wrapping up my questions with Dr. Brody. So if you, want, if you have questions, please go ahead and add them right in the chat box, the chat area, both on LinkedIn and YouTube. So Dr. Brody, the FRF's mission continues to expand which means more space and resources are needed. Can you tell us about the brand new FRF Annex and what research it will support? You just had the ribbon cutting last week. Yes, yeah, we're super excited about this new building that we hear that we have here on site at the FRF. Um, you know, so one of the first things I mentioned, we, we've really grown our staff in the last recent years, and and so this new building will first and foremost provide office space and more research space for our staff, meeting space and and conference room space, which which is just really exciting, particularly after COVID and having everybody return back back to the office. Um, so we're super excited about that. Um, it was funded with minor mill pond construction funds. Um, and so uh, it's really focused on supporting our, our growing and expanding uh, uh, mission to support the warfighter. And so in particular, we have a, a large instrumentation space that's associated uh, with this new annex, and that allows us to work on, on some of those um, 
autonomous systems that I talked a little bit about. So some of the uh, drone systems, the UAVs, but also some of our uh, in-water autonomous systems. And that's a really big growing area of research for us. If we look at the current climate that we're in in the DOD and we think about where in the world potential future climate or, or conflicts might be, um, the maritime environment is going to be a huge part of that. And, you know, we're, we're going to have to be likely operating in, you know, contested environments against peer or near peer adversaries. And so, we're going to have to be a lot lighter, a lot quicker, a lot faster, a lot more distributed in the types of operations that we do. And autonomous systems are going to play a really big role in those efforts. Um, and I think one of the things that we're excited to contribute here at the FRF to the development of autonomous systems is our knowledge of surf zone environment hazards. Right now, you know, most people don't want to take their autonomous uh, surface vessels or, or underwater vessels anywhere near the surf zone. They say, we're going to stay, you know, clear of that, right? We don't want to deal with breaking waves, strong currents, things like that. And so I think we're really excited to work more with that community to think about, hey, how might we be able to exploit some of these natural processes to stay safe with autonomous systems or to figure out the best path to navigate through. So I think um, having this new instrumentation space in the annex is, is really going to allow us to, to grow that program and grow in that direction. Um, one of the other things that uh, we have have as part of uh, this building is sort of a new secure computing facility um, where we can help support in more uh, reach back capabilities to to operations that are that are going on. So so we're excited to be able to work in that space a little bit to support our joint forces um, as they sort of embark on some of these challenging missions. Absolutely fascinating. So our first question from the audience goes back to something you mentioned a little bit earlier about collecting data during hurricanes and storms. It says, sure. is, is the FRF able to collect data during hurricanes and storms? If so, how is this research impacting coastal resilience and help coastal communities? Sure, that's a great question. So yes, uh, that is one of our number one goals is to collect continuous observations of the coast. And that means during storms and in particular during our biggest storms, so uh, hurricanes. Um, I think one of the cool parts about maintaining this continuous data record is, you know, we've literally observed every storm that has passed the North Carolina coast for the last 40 years. Um, and so if you look at that that's pretty impressive. You know, we, we don't have to respond to a storm. All the infrastructure is there. And we hope, fingers crossed, that the data sets continue to work. We've put a lot of effort into making them as robust as possible. Um, and one, you know, one of the ways we do that is a lot of our in situ instrumentation um, are installed on these uh, pipes that are jetted meters into the seafloor. So, so we might have, you know, a, a five meter long pipe and about, you know, three to to four meters of that pipe is in the seafloor and then only a meter sticks up. And so that can account for the really rapid bathymetric change that might happen during a hurricane as a sandbar moves back and forth. And, and so that ensures that the data um, continues to be collected uh, during the storms. Um, and then I think the second part of the question was, so the first was, do we collect data during hurricanes? Yes. And, and then how does do that it? impact coastal resilience? Yes. How does that impact coastal resilience? So, you know, I think a big thing that we've learned here at the FRF is just how rapidly the coast, the coast can change during a storm. But because we collect those continuous data sets, we also get to re observe the recovery processes. And so how, do the, how does the beach build back up? Um, what are the timescales of those recovery processes? What are the conditions that lead to it? And then, you know, once the sand moves from the surf zone on, onto the beach, that creates wider beaches. Once we get those wider beaches, and we have that increased sediment supply. Um, we've been focusing, one of our researchers here has been focusing a lot recently on thinking about how dunes regrow following storms. And so how does the wind blow the sand and the vegetation help to trap the sand to, to grow the dunes? Because the dunes are really our first line of defense for many of our coastal communities. Um, and so understanding how dynamic dune systems are, how they naturally erode, that the erosion of the dune 
is the natural buffer of the coast to these large storm events. But the, then the dunes grow back out. And so it's really this, this natural sort of ebb and flow of erosion and accretion that helps add uh, protection to our coastal communities. And you know there are things that we can do to potentially help accelerate that recovery and accelerate that, that dune growth. And so thinking about how we can design our, our engineering solutions to work with nature to help build build those dunes faster is, is definitely one of the current areas of research that we're focusing on here. So our next question is from Chris, and I think you kind of answered some of his questions. It says, okay. do you review the work the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has put into barrier walls to protect beach erosion? Though they cannot stop uh, the rise of sea level, um, they could possibly save beach, sand, and homes from hurricane damage. Um, so I think that the question is, you know, how do we work with our districts in designing some of these like harder engineering solutions to coastal erosion? Um, you know, so we certainly, you know, one of the great parts about Erdic is Erdic serves as, you know, reach back to our uh, Corps of Engineers districts who are designing these engineering solutions. And so there's a lot of communication back and forth between the, the district engineers um, and the and the Erdic scientists and, and to make sure that the uh, you know the research we're doing at Erdic is is helping and and benefiting them. Um, you know, one of the things the the FRF is really a uh, natural laboratory. Um, and so we don't do a lot of hard engine. We don't really test a lot of hard engineering solutions here at the FRF because our focus has been more largely on sort of quantifying and understanding the natural environment processes that are occurring. Um, and so, you know, we haven't explicitly focused on evaluating the, the role of, of seawalls and, and things like that, but we certainly, you know, work with our district engineers when needed. To, to understand a, a specific project site and, and try to understand whether a you know more natural solution like a beach nourishment is the right solution or, or whether you truly need to go to that hard engineering wall like structure um, and it's sort of on a case by case basis uh, to sort of answer that question. Very good. And I want to remind the audience if you are just now tuning in and you've missed some of this conversation. Um, we are talking today with Dr. Kate Brody, who is an oceanographer at our field research facility in Duck, North Carolina. And so she's talking today about the most studied beach area and how that is being used to make the world better and safer every day. So our next question is from Mark. Can you update the audience on how the work on developing quick measurements of beach erosion after a hurricane is progressing and how it has helped state and local governments complete their initial damage assessments? Uh, sure. So some of that technology I mentioned about using drones to help make rapid measurements pre and post storm. We've been working with our districts to help get that into engineering practice. So we, we did a lot of the R&D to develop the techniques. And then we've been working with our districts to then transition those techniques and, and teach them how to do it and how to use it. Um, and you know there are there are some districts around the country that are using it a lot more than others, and a lot of that has to do with with the resources that you know they have available and and the length of coast that they have to sort of investigate following a storm. You know you're not going to take a drone out and and fly hundreds of kilometers of coastline following a storm to assess the impacts. Um, you know it's it's much more suited to some of these project or smaller project scales. Um, you know, and, and that's where the core of engineers has has other capabilities like our, our airborne lidar mapping program through through Jabaltex, which is a manned aircraft that can go out and you know map hundreds of kilometers of of coastline following some of these major storms. Um, so in terms of how that is 
getting back into the hands of state and, and local governments. I would say, you know, as a researcher, that is probably left more to our, our districts to manage that interaction and, and communication with the stakeholders. I do know in the management of a lot of these coastal project sites, there's a lot of, of interaction between the local governments, the stakeholders, um, and, uh, you know, the, the federally, the federal design of the project. Um, and one of the things that we are working on right now is a project that we're calling CoreCam um, that one of our researchers is heading up. And, and that's that effort I talked about about putting cameras at uh, different locations along the coastline. Um, and so, you know, if you have a camera up on a hotel and it's, you know, continuously observing the coast, we can measure the shoreline position and you could do that immediately post storm. And so if you need to make a measurement of what the beach width is, post storm and, and that goes into some of the calculations of how bad were the storm impacts, can you apply for those federal funds um, to fix uh, or, or rehabilitate the coast following a storm. Um, we're, we're working right now with headquarters to figure out what sort of an enterprise rollout looks like of that. How do we work through the relationships between the districts, the stakeholders and the local governments to see who would support that type of monitoring technology and, and how do we communicate and, and get those observations passed back and forth. Um, Hopefully that answers the question. I'd be I happy think it to does. follow up more if, if there's more <laughs> specifics. So our next question is from Jared. Um, what are the biggest research goals for you and your team over the next decade? Over the next decade? Wow, that is a big picture question. Um, so I think some of our, our biggest research goals, I would say, so I, I think on the really technical side of this, we actually talked about this right before the start of the broadcast, you know, sediment transport is a, still a huge uh, open question for uh, the community as a whole, you know, those our sediment transport algorithms are still very parameterized in most of our numerical models, which means there's a lot of coefficients, uh, numbers that you can tweak and tune to get the right answer if you know what the right answer is. But, but being able to make true morphology evolution predictions at scales ranging from storms to decades, um, you know, that's still really hard for us as a community. We have some models that do an okay job at it sometimes in some conditions, but but truly being able to do that in a range of environments without having to tweak and tune those coefficients, I think that's, you know, a really open area of research for us as a community. And so I think, you know, there are certainly some questions in there that we'd like to start to pick off pieces of that we can answer here at the FRF. We certainly are, are not going to solve that massive problem <laughs> ourselves. Um, and then I think like I would I would come back to this idea of big coastal data. Um, you know, it's it's really a paradigm shift for the community, this idea that we can have lots of observations and and what do you do with those observations? How do you start to integrate those observations in real time to our numerical model predictions? That might really help us do a better job at uh, forecasting how our coasts are going to change. You know, I think you can think about it, you know, relative to the weather community, maybe um, in like the 19, I think there was sort of a, a big revolution in the 1960s, 70s um, for the weather forecasting community. The advent of satellites hugely increased the number of observations that they could make. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, their forecasts started getting a lot better because suddenly they can start to couple all of the meteorological observations with their global models and their, their the information from those observations are being fed into the models and, and back and forth and, and their predictions and their capabilities as a whole field sort of leapt ahead. And I think we're sort of on the cusp of that in the fields of coastal engineering and science right now. Um, you know, we've developed a lot of these new observation techniques, whether that's autonomous systems roaming our coasts, collecting continuous observations or satellites giving us continuous observations. Now we're at the point of saying, okay, 
what do we do with that data? How do we trust that data? When do we trust that data? And then how do we get those observations to talk to our numerical models so that we can make the best forecasts and predictions and, and do a better job of uh, forecasting risk and, and communicating risk to our, our communities along the coasts? So our next question from the audience is, what makes North Carolina's Outer Banks an ideal location for the FRF? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, so they really looked at a lot of places around the country when they were considering where to put the FRF. Um, again, one of the big focuses was, sto was storms. Um, and so they wanted somewhere that experienced a lot of storms. So the, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, it sort of sticks out like this little angle into the Atlantic Ocean. It has a very narrow continental shelf, at least for the U.S. East Coast. Um, it's one of the narrowest places along the U.S. East Coast. What, what that means is the waves don't lose a lot of energy to, to friction in terms of interacting with the bottom. Um, and we get hit by both tropical systems, you know, in the late summer and fall coming up from the south, moving up out of the Caribbean area, hurricanes, things like that. But we also get hit with a lot of extra tropical and, and nor'easter systems. And so that really makes up our storm season in, in the late fall and into the winter and spring. And, and so it really is three quarters of our year, we are getting exposed to this high wave energy condition. So if you want to study storms, um, this is a great place <laughs> to do it because you get a lot of them and you get a lot of different types of storms. Um, and so I think that was one of the, the major driving factors for selecting uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Now, it is, you know, a sandy open coast beach, and that's clearly not reflective of all of the coastal environments of the U.S. Um, and, you know, so it we certainly won't solve all of our coastal problems by collecting measurements here, but I, I think, you know, we're, we're solving a lot of them and we're learning a lot about coastal processes, in, you know, particularly in a sandy coastal environment. So the next question is from Philip, and he asks, what is the role of digital twin or elaborate simulation environments that employ physics models of the environment and events in planning and trying various solution efforts. Um, so yeah, I think digital twin is, is certainly the the hot ticket uh, word right now um, in the in science and engineering fields. Um, and you know, I I like to think of of digital twin as you know a really high resolution you know model environment. And and if you build your digital twin correct, then you should be able to interrogate it and, and try different different solutions as was um, suggested. So, you know, I, I think it might be cool to start to build a, a digital twin um, of the FRF here. Um, we could certainly use it here to to inform, you know, potential the experiment design and, and where to place new sensors and new instruments and things like that. Um, and, and then as you start to in interrogate those models, um, you know, you can figure out wh where where you're doing well and where you're not. And then that helps drive some of the, the new research and the new physics questions that you want to ask. Um, so I think that is, you know, it's a really interesting question. We haven't dove into the digital twin world here at the FRF. We've definitely been talking about it a little bit and, and thinking about how it could benefit us and, and the research that we do here. Um, so another question from the audience is how can other researchers collaborate and gain access to the data you have collected? Oh, that's a great question. So all of our data is uh, publicly available. It's all posted on the web, um, the entire historical record. We had a big effort about five years ago to sort of uh, fully organize and, and modernize how we were storing and serving all of that data. So we have a, a thread server. If you Google CHL threads, T-H-R-E-D-D-S, that should get you to the main uh, threads repository for for all of the FRF data. And there's a lot of different ways that you can interact with those data. Um, you can set up, you know, 
backend ways to access it by writing codes and scripts that basically crawl the thread server and um, grab it for you down onto your workstation. There also is a, a data portal um, that allows you to sort of explore it a little bit more visually. Um, and so, you know, we, we truly try to serve as much of our data as possible. Some of our bigger remote sensing data sets. Um, we serve the processed products from those remotely sensed data, but we do not right now serve um, in near real time the raw data sets because the bandwidth is just a little bit much, but um, you can always reach out to us and those raw data sets are also publicly available for, for anyone to use for, for research purposes or, or whatever you need it for. Um, and in terms of uh, collaborating with us, and you know, if you want to come here to do an experiment, um, so you know that usually starts by an email reaching out to myself or or our branch chief Aaron Durba, and, and sort of talking about the project that you're interested in doing, and then we have some you know facility use fees. Then we can work up sort of a cost. We can work with you to develop a cost estimate to sort of scope your project to figure out what is feasible and and what it would take to support that type of effort and, and then there's a number of different agreements that you know we can utilize to work with either other federal agencies private industry academia so so we can always work through that process in in terms of um, collaborating and coming here to do experiments absolutely and i want to remind the audience if you um want to collaborate with dr brody or have questions about data or how to collaborate you can easily send an info an an email to erticinfo at usace.army.mil, erticinfo at usace.army.mil, and they will co connect you to the right people at FRF. And so the next question from the audience is about DUNEX. Can you tell us about the DUNEX field experiment in 2021? What were some of the discoveries that emerged from that event? And what were some of the lessons learned from conducting a collaborative community experiment? Yeah, great question. So uh, DUNEX was a super fun field effort um, that just recently completed. So DUNEX as an acronym stands for During Nearshore Event Experiment. Um, and you know the big focus of DUNEX was to really try to understand the physical processes um, that occur during extreme storm occurrence storm events across a, a barrier island complex as a whole. So not just thinking about the surf zone, but thinking about the processes when the waves are actually hitting the beach and when the waves are then interacting with the dune and are interacting with the groundwater table beneath the barrier island. And then how does that start to in interact with you know, other inland processes and inland flooding processes. And so um, it was a really cool experiment. It was facilitated by the U.S. Coastal Research Program, which is a consortium of uh, U.S. federal agencies that have interest in the coastal environment. Uh, they helped provide uh, logistics support for the FRF to be able to support the field needs of all the collaborators. Um, we had collaborators from, you know, I think it was over 15 different universities, federal agencies were here, um, and people were conducting experiments on the Outer Banks anywhere from uh, just north of the FRF up in up in Kerala. We had some folks doing some experiments up in the dunes up there, all the way south to the Oregon Inlet area and farther south onto Pea Island into the National Wildlife Refuge. And, and so researchers were able to come together and ask a lot of these, uh, you know, really important, relevant questions, particularly for society and, and thinking about how extreme storms impact these barrier island communities, but do so in the environments that that they chose to work in. And, and then, you know, we can we're sort of now at the point where um, you know, a lot of the graduate students are really diving into the data that was collected during the storms. And, you know, this stuff does take time. I think um, sometimes people don't uh, recognize or appreciate, you know, there's the whole data collection effort, and then there's the data analysis side of it, and you've got to dive into that data set. And, and that's where we really are right now is, you know, the graduate students are really getting into their dissertations and their theses and diving into the data. And, and then we hope, you know, to have that exchange between the graduate students where we can start to look at this barrier island system as a whole and understand how the different processes are all interacting with each other. Um, and, you know, I think 
one of the things that will be really interesting to come out of it is, is like I said, we had a lot of focus on, um, you know, the interaction of the waves with the dune system and infiltration through the beach with the underlying groundwater tables and thinking about how the groundwater responds to both the, the rain inputs during storm during hurricanes, but but also the oceanic inputs. And you've got these water levels sloshing around on side to side, the sound on the backside, the ocean on the other side. And, you know, all of those pieces have to come together to get an accurate understanding of the flood risks to the community. And so I think that's an example of where some of these integrated studies that occurred during Dunex will, will really help some of our local communities manage these risks during hurricanes. That's one of the things I loved about the Dunex project was that it shows the power of Erdic. Of Erdic is so good at bringing multiple people to the table, academia and industry and all these researchers from other government agencies. And that's what we're about is collaboration and let's all come to the table together to solve these complex problems. So that was one of my favorite things about the Dunex project. Um, our next question brings up something that you mentioned just a little bit early on. Could you tell us a little bit more about CoreCam and how citizen scientists can contribute to that program? Sure. Um, so CoreCam is an effort that's being led by uh, Dr. Brittany Bruder, one of the researchers here at the FRF. Um, and we basically, the, the premise of that project is to think about how we can use coastal imaging technology to improve management of our coastlines. And what do I mean by coastal imaging technology? That's just a fancy way of saying taking pictures of the coast. Um, and so that could be from a scientific grade camera that's installed on a rooftop of a hotel that's really precisely surveyed in. Um, or that could be from a webcam, for example, that might be put up for other purposes. Um, you know, a lot of municipalities have webcams for monitoring traffic or, or use of, of different resources or there's surf cams, things like that, but they're taking continuous imagery of the coast. Um, one of the things that we've been working with is um, some colleagues of ours over at um, University of New South Wales in, Aus in Australia have worked to develop uh, this tool called CoastSnap, um, which is exactly that. It's a citizen scientist coastal imaging um, approach. And so we've been working with them through one of the groups that I lead, the Coastal Imaging Research Network, which is this global consortium of uh, researchers who are interested in thinking about how we can exploit collecting imagery of our coasts. Um, and so, you know, uh, Brittany and uh, Ian Connery here have been working with our districts to add some of our sites, deploy some of these coast snap stations. Um, and that's a place where um, anyone can, you know, they're usually on piers or on places with a little bit high elevation along the coast, restaurants, things like that. And anyone can walk up and it's, it's just a very simple little camera stand. You place your smartphone in that stand and you take a picture and then there's a little QR code and you scan that QR code and you submit it. Um, and that gets sucked into our coastal imaging processing database, which uh, Brittany has been working really hard to automate. Um, and we can take basically all of the same processing algorithms that we've worked with academia and other federal agencies to develop using the, the Argus Tower here at the FRF. And we can now run those on people's smartphone images. And so from that one image that somebody takes of the coast, we can get a quantitative representation of where the shoreline is at that moment. Um, and so it's pretty cool. We have a coast snap station here on the Outer Banks uh, down at Jeanette's Pier, which is this great uh, science center, um, part of the North Carolina Aquarium. Um, and so particularly during the summer, we get, you know, you know, probably like 20 images taken during a day from folks visiting the pier. And once we start, to, if you get 20 images of the shoreline during the day, you can actually get a, a really quite an accurate representation of where the shoreline is. And, and so we can monitor the shoreline changes along that stretch of coast just from citizen scientists uh, pictures of the beach, which I think is really pretty cool. That is really pretty cool how you're leveraging crowdsourcing to uh, mm -hmm. collect data. That's absolutely phenomenal. Our next question from the audience is the FRF um, has been called the world's most studied beach. That's what we talked about earlier. 
Um, how do you share this knowledge with academia and other government agencies? You talked a little bit that, about that already, about how to go to the website and get that information. Can you share an example of a collaborative research study at FRF? So is there a good um, case study of where you worked with another um, university or maybe a district on solving a problem? Yeah, um, we do a lot of those every year. <laughs> um, so there's probably hundreds to choose from to talk about. Um, so yeah, I think um, one of one of the ways that we try to work with other federal agencies um, and with academia is number one through sharing all of our data through maintaining the best um, you know most robust continuous data record that we can here. We take a lot of pride in making sure those data are QC'd to the best of our ability. Um, you know, sometimes we don't always get it right and we have to go back and reprocess it, but then we try to get that, you know, better data pushed out to the community. It's it's sort of like a, a full-time job, even though we've been doing it for 45 years, you always have a new things that come up and, and change the quality of data. Um, so I think, you know, one of the biggest ways we try to contribute to the global research community is is through the through providing and continuing to collect those continuous observations. It, I think that data set really has become a, a national treasure, I would say, or, or maybe like a, a global treasure, um, because there's really no other data set that's um, comparable in terms of the record length and the comprehensive observations that, that we make. There's a, there's a few similar data sets in, in Japan and in Australia and in the, in the Netherlands that have, have pieces of um, the observation record, but I think, you know, the, the comprehensiveness of the record collected here at the, at the FRF is really, truly a, a unique contribution in the world. Um, so in terms of, I think you asked for an example of uh, a collaborative research study or project that we've done here. Um, I'd say that's probably one of my most favorite things about working here is we get visiting scientists coming in all the time. Um, so we have a uh, long-standing collaboration with some researchers up at, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution or, or HUI, um, you know, and they come here uh, every fall uh, to, to execute some new experiment that they're focused on. Um, so last fall, um, we they were looking at, they were working with us to think about how we can do better at remotely sensing uh, near shore currents and comparing that to some of the in situ measurements. Um, and in particular, you know, we we can already do a pretty good job as a community at getting some of those uh, wave averaged currents pretty well over longer time periods. But they were looking at really short time scale fluctuations in the currents. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that's sort of like the last 10% um, of our understanding of nearshore hydrodynamics, but sometimes that last 10% can be the, the most important 10% in terms of getting something like sediment transport right. Um, and so that was really fun. They were flying drones, we were flying drones, we had cameras on the tower, there were in situ gauges that had been deployed to try to uh, ground treat that. And, and one of the things that they always do is uh, bring a lot of their graduate students. And so it's a really nice opportunity to meet and talk to the next generation of coastal researchers. Um, and then one of the things that they always provide provide us is for our early career researchers who are just starting out, um, you know, they provide the opportunity for them to work directly with the, the academic colleagues during those, you know, four weeks that they're here. And, and so some of our scientists get to go effectively intern with um, the academics who are here and, and can learn a lot about data processing or their techniques for installing instrumentation um, or or some of the more science questions. And so I, you know, I think that exchange of knowledge and communication between the external researchers and, and the staff here at the FRF is, you know, one of the best parts of those collaborative experiments. And I think, you know, when you talk to a lot of the folks that participated in those um, early multi-investigator experiments here at the FRF, that's like the one thing they keep coming back to is how much it brought the community together and how 
how much more science exchange and advancement there was because people were here working together on the same thing, you know, having a beer together after work, cooking out on the beach and talking science, exchanging ideas, thinking about paper topics, thinking about conference sessions, things like that, thinking about new experiments that they could try. Um, and so I think as a researcher working here, that collaborative aspect, getting to work with so many outside people is, is really one of the most fantastic aspects of working here. Well, Kate, I think I can speak for a lot of us. I think a lot of us are jealous of your, <laughs> of your job. That sounds yeah. like so much fun and, and all the science that you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us today on Erdic Live. It has been a complete joy to talk to you today. And we could continue talking because I love <laughs> to talk to you about all the research you do. But I want to remind our audience that our next Arctic Live is February 17th. And you don't want to miss this one because this one we will be talking to Dr. David Pittman. And this will be the Friday before we kick off Engineer Week. So be sure to tune in and go ahead and set that time aside for Friday, February 17th. Until next time, find your joy. We'll see you soon.